respectively on the substantive content in unit six. And I pray that God give us grace to deliver that unit, a uh, unit seven, I should say, to deliver the unit easily in an accessible way. So you will get it and do well. The unit seven is entitled uh, Inductive Reasoning in the Sciences and Everyday Life. What's the outline? We are going to remind you of the basic principles of inductive reasoning. Verifiability, confirmability, and native induction, law-like and statistical hypothesis. And that will be all. You should just know these. That's the outline. It's a build up from what you have learned so far in the course. And Mr. Kwanza did a good job with you on the deduction part of reasoning in unit six. Unit seven focuses on induction. Let's, let's just quickly recall what it means to reason inductively. He says, unlike deduction, an inductive argument, the premises, the evidence, eh, provide some reasons or evidence that makes you believe the conclusion will be probably true, not certain. Probability, degree of likelihood, chances are that. Mm. The premises do not prove, look at the language, proof, no, or guarantee the truth of conclusion. When we say it is waterproof, it means water cannot get through, cannot. You see? So when you say the reasoning is a proof, it means it comes with certainty. It can't be otherwise. That's what happens in deduction when validly done. So the modus ponens and modus tollens reasoning pattern that you studied in unit six are proofs. If it were true that all women are cheats, if it were true, it is a conditional, eh? If it were true that all women were cheats. And it is also true, that is, if we took it to be also true that my pastor's wife is a woman, then what is true of all women would necessarily be true of her. So if it were true that all women were cheated, my pastor's wife is a woman, then it will follow deductively that she is also what a cheat. It's a conditional statement. Granted that the premises were true, the conclusion must also be true. Otherwise, you create a contradiction. That is what we learned with deduction. What the pattern I just used is a modus ponens valid pattern. You are deducing the conclusion from the premises. You have to play back the recording I've shared with you to refresh your memories on that. But when we do induction, it is possible for the premises to be true and yet the conclusion denied. In other words, the conclusion is false and the, there's no contradiction created. There's no tension. So if I say most Ghanaians like pineapple or most women are cheats, let's use the same example. Most women are cheats and my pastor's wife is a woman. So I believe she's also a cheat. This reasoning, even if we were to grant the premises to be true, the conclusion doesn't necessarily follow. Your funny say no say pastor your by force I say on also be it because you say What I just said in G, I've said in English several times. Let me see if I can hazard a gravation. I'm a shoe, I mean, I'm a woman, eh? GPA, she 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 cheat, eh? <laughs> cheat in the other sense of it, not just cheating someone as in Wagadre, but cheat as in playing around. Okay, ye P, Fiona kind. Okay, I gave ye fair Fiona kind. It's not the same. So we can accept the premises as true, and yet we are not obliged to accept the conclusion that comes with it. That kind of reasoning is what we call induction, inducing, you're forcing the conclusion out. It's not part of it. So when we have an inductive argument, 
Remember something else you should know. Look on my screen, please, respectfully. They do not prove, their premises do not prove the conclusion. Mm. Third point, their premises do not necessarily lead to the conclusion. In other words, the conclusion you are drawing doesn't necessarily, take note of that way, see that is in italics, that's not, that's not necessarily follow. It may follow, it may not follow. So most women cheat. At, Yaya is a woman, therefore she cheats. This therefore she, she cheats, which is the conclusion I'm drawing, may result from the premises or may not. There is no necessity. That's why it's not a proof. So you can have the premises being to that most women cheat and Yaya to being a woman. And for this instance, Yaya may not be a cheat, may not. It will follow. So when you, that's reasoning is inductive because the conclusion does not necessarily follow from the premises, even if the premises were granted to be true. We said all this in unit six, it's a repetition. Then what else should you remember? When you are doing induction point number four, count my highlighted there, my, what's the name, my bullet there, you see the, the fourth bullet point. When you are doing induction, the meanings of the content or information provided matters in confirming the degree of likelihood of your conclusion based on the strength of the evidence presented. If I said few Ghanaians are hospitable, Ajo is also Ghanaian, therefore she's hospitable. Because I said few, the chances that she will also be hospitable is less. Because I said few, my starting point said few. Not many of them are hospitable. Ajo is one of them. You see, few there, the chances of your conclusion being true is less. But if I had said most Ghanaians are hospitable from my data, then there are higher degrees or higher chances that my conclusion will be true. So what you will see that when you are doing induction, you look at subject matter, the content. You, don't, you just don't look at the structure or the form alone. It is in deduction that all you are looking at is the pattern. You want to unlock your phone. You do create the Z very well. The password is a Z. Did, did you do it well? It's just a pattern. So I can say all oh, chichis are chaches. This thing is a chichi, therefore it is a chacha. It will be valid. We don't know what chichi is. We don't know what chacha is. But if I look at the pattern, all oh, chichis are chaches. The thing I'm holding now is a chichi. Then it must be a chacha, whatever the chichi and the chacha represent, brothers and sisters in the Lord. We don't know. But we are not interested because Deduction is topic neutral, it's neutral to the topic. It's not interested in the subject matter. So I can say all A's are B's and all B's are C's. It has to follow therefore that all A's are C's. Women fly. My lecturer is a woman. It has to follow that she flies. Deductively, modus ponens. Meanwhile, if we were to subject the content to scrutiny, it might not even be speaking to actuality. Well, the reasoning, the conclusion follows deductively from the premises. So when you do deduction, you are not looking at subject matter. Remember, Mr. Mr. Kwanza dealt with that. These slides are already in your, I pulled it from your resource too, you saw it. It's already there, these things I'm saying are there. Then he has come to engage you on it. And today we are mopping up to show you what induction is not so induction is not deduction and if you want to understand ndc very well sometimes you have to study mpp and vice versa because if you know what it is not it helps you to know what it is so inductive reasoning is distinct from deduction a certain because of a certain way that they are how are they one has premises that proves the conclusion, if validly done, that's deduction. The other one doesn't prove its conclusion. It only confirms or uh, what gives a degree of probability or likelihood of the conclusion being true if the premises were true, okay? Conclusion may be false, even if it is assumed that the premises are true. You have all that, so look at this. Therefore, what? What should you deduce from what has been said so far? Therefore, the more evidence you have Take note, suppose I want to draw a conclusion that women are cheats. 
if I have a lot of evidence, particular instances, remember particular versus general, if I have a lot of particular instances that support what I'm saying, then I increase the degree of likelihood of what I'm saying being true or false. Suppose I want to say women are cheat. Then you ask me, what is my grounds, my evidence, my reasons, my premises for saying that? What is the reason? Then I tell you, oh, yeah, yeah. Look on my screen now. Then I say, oh, I did tell Dama. She cheated. She's a woman. I did tell yeah. She to the same. Kofi dated Mansa. She cheated. Uh, so this is what I'm doing. I am counting. I'm enumerating. I saw Mr. Kwanza was engaging on that before the network started about him. I'm counting several instances to support the claim I make. What is the claim I want to make that all oh, women are cheats? What's my reason? I have a thousand and one instances that I'm counting, enumerating. So the more evidences, particular instances I have that support the claim I'm making. Take note, the higher, back to where we were, go back, look at me, please. I said, look at me, look on the screen. The more evidence you have that corroborate, the word corroborate means uh, it coheres with it, it supports it. The higher the degree of confirmation. Don't say that the more evidence you have, therefore you have proven. The language is wrong. You don't prove it. If it's proof, it can't be false. You can't have a counterfactual, unit six, unit uh, five, the normative versus the empirical. But the reason why when you have a generalization like that, women are cheats, men are bullies, uh, metals expand when heated, women deliver in nine months when they get pregnant, all these generalizations, uh, when prices of goods and services are increased, people buy less. These are all generalizations, unit five. I sent you a recording after your interaction sessions. Mm? All these generalizations, you arrive at them by observing particular instances. That's the scientific method, the empirical method. You observe several particular instances of that thing. Whenever you throw a ball up, it came down. So when Yaya threw a ball, it came back. When Kofi did, it came back. When did, so you draw a generalization, a hypothetical statement. That's the word, hypothesis. On the basis of particular evidential statement okay so the more evidence you have you are only increasing the degree of like we say probability probability is never equal to one it's never certain because there's always the potential of what a counter factual so you will see what is in red on my screen now so on slide number four patiently being delivered and you have to understand the concept and can we are done Confirmation is not proof. Yashenema, and she say you prove we have given higher, more evidence. So if, as of today, I had only instances of about, about 90 women, particular women that cheated, and that was my evidence supporting my claim. Suppose my, by, by this evening, I get 300 extra evidences. It makes my claim which claim is that, that all women are cheat? Highly probable. I shouldn't say that now I have proven it. Okay, that's the point. So confirmation is not proof because it, why is it not proof? Because there's always a possibility that I will find one woman that is not a cheat. And just that one counterfactual, remember you need five, the normative versus the empirical, just that one counterfactual who come and negate the hundreds and hundreds of women that I found who cheated. So we don't want to say we have proven. Okay, there are types of induction, just like there were types of deduction. The types of deduction were modus ponens, tolens, hypothetical syllogism, disjunctive syllogism. But the types of inductive argument are what? Sampling, argument based on sampling, argument based on analogy, causal reasoning enumerative induction. So these are just some more examples. Your TA took, your Twitter took you through that, so I won't worry myself. Why the reasoning is inductive. Even if you accepted the two premises given in most of the cases as true, it doesn't necessarily lead you to the conclusion, so, so and so and so, that's so and so and so, therefore so and so. That's what the essence of this slide is, to give you instances to remind you of what uh, offended induction is. Then on the current uh, 
screen, you see enumerative induction. Now you know it. It is a type of induction that counts its evidences in order to support the conclusion being drawn. You see that if I had all these evidences and I had concluded that so based on all these particular instances of women that cheated, therefore I am concluding that all women are cheat. The conclusion I've drawn can easily be made false. All I need is one woman, Enumere Virgin, Jesus name, who didn't cheat. And it will make this claim false because I spoke in the universal. Look at the generalization, the kind of hypothesis I concluded. I said, therefore, all women are cheat. The pain you are feeling from the cheating you is real, and we, be we bear with you. We can feel for you. But please, your conclusion, dear, it is speaking like God, infinite. Remember generalizations, OK? If you conclude on the basis of the instances you have observed, that therefore all women, all women is a universal generalization, law-like generalization. Remember, even part one, the one I've given you, is there. I've showed you that. You can make a general statement in a safe way. Which one is that? On your screen now, quickly. Statistical. There. You can generalize in a statistical way. So we have universal generalization, which is also called law-like generalization. And we can distinguish that from what? Statistical generalization. They are both general, but one makes room for exception. If I say most women are cheats, I can be a woman sitting next to you. I don't have to feel angry. You said most. I may be one of the few. So I don't have to say, why are you saying we women are like that? He said most, auntie. Why do you want to be included in the set of those who are cheats? When he said, <laughs> uh, is it by force? Someone says 90% of politicians are corrupt. You are a politician in the studio. Why do you say, why are you talking about us like that? If we like talking about us, it says 90%, boga. Why do you want to be in the 90 when there is a 10% that you can belong to? So when people speak generally, but they make exceptions to the rule, that simply means they leave some members out. It's a statistical general, generalization. That is easier to make true. That is likely to be true if you compared it with what? A universal generalization. A universal generalization has a higher degree of being false because you can't speak like God. You don't know everything. So you say, because of what I have seen about these particular women, I am concluding that what? Therefore, all women are cheats. You, you, just one woman who is not a cheat will make your turn false. If you get the distinction, then you will see that when you have an enumerative induction, big word, nothing much. Look at the reasoning, which concludes with a statistical generalization. The word generalization is what you change to what hypothesis, hypothetical, hyped up thesis, mm? a hypo. Thesis. thesis is a statement. You've blown it out of proportion. That's all. So we are saying that when you have the conclusion of an inductive argument, you describe it as a hypothesis. You don't call it conclusion, like Agbena concluded, no. So what you would have said conclusion for deduction, we say hypothesis for induction. What you would have called premises for deduction, we call it evidence in induction. Okay, so just a switch of terminologies. Don't stress yourself. Now I'm saying that you would therefore see that when we have a reasoning, an argument, that is an enumerative induction where you count your evidences to arrive at a certain general claim that you are making. When we have that type of induction, remember induction can be several other types, not only enumerative induction. We just saw argument based on analogy, argument based on sampling and the others up there. But we are looking at this particular one. Which one? the type we call enumerative induction. When we have enumerative induction, that ends with the statistical hypothesis. This type, the one on your screen now. It has a higher degree of likelihood. That means it, the chances of it being true is higher than if you have one that ends in what? A low light hypothesis, like this particular one. 
Simply put, if I, I list all the evidences, I dated that she cheated, I dated yeah, she cheated, I dated man, she cheated, I dated that fee. Therefore, and I conclude, therefore, all women are cheats. That can easily be made false. This is my reasoning, can easily be made false. Compared to the one that after listing all of them, I say, so most women are cheat. And most women are cheat one, which is a statistical generalization being the conclusion. And that type can, is easier to be true. But you'll be amazed that the empirical scientist prefers the one that can easily be made false. And that is what I want to say. There's a logic behind, there's a reasoning behind that. The, the empirical scientists, the ones studying the world, look at my screen, please. I keep projecting from one screen to the other because I want you to understand. So see, hear, engage, write if you are writing notes and you do fine. Eh? The empirical scientists prefers all women are cheats conclusion to the one that says most women are cheats. Why would you prefer the one that can easily be false? When you have one that has a higher degree of likelihood because of the logic of what empirical study and that is one is technical I have to help you see it so i'm here to do that by the grace of god now see we know confirmation is not proved so those ones are more we know verifiable versus confirm i'll come back to that but why would all this particular versus general we have, we have seen it so I'm going straight to why the logic. You see what I'm doing all this? You've seen the, the examples, the degrees of confirmation. Now let's go and see why the sign. Very good. This is it. Why would, why would the empirical scientists prefer a statement that can easily be made false compared to the one that can easily be made true? If there's one that is easy to make true, why wouldn't you go for that, a statistical hypothesis? Why would you go for a universal one? I want one of you to read what is on the screen for me. Let me allow your mics now quickly. Allow mics. Very good. Then I'll take questions in a minute. But let's have one read what is on your screen. Dr. Okay. Okay. Uh, is it uh, Ata? Yes, madam. No, please. Dimitra, read this is Helen. Me. Okay, Helen, read for me. I think your background is fine. Let's listen to Helen. Eh? Don't put too much uh, okay. picture, picture into the record. So that when you play back, you will benefit. To confirm than oh, well, let, like let Helen read there, boss. Okay. I beg you, okay? Helen asks to read. I beg, mm. okay? Respect you. Helen, go ahead. Yeah. Or mute and read. Go ahead. Helen, unmute first. I muted all again, so unmute and read. So oh, thank you very much. Go ahead. Why falsifiability is valuable to the empirical scientist? Good. When a theory is falsified, then the empirical scientist can be certain that it is not true. Good. But when a theory is confirmed, it only means that it only means there is currently evidence that corroborates the likelihood of the theory being true. Good. But the empirical scientists cannot be certain that a confirmed theory is certainly true because there is always the possibility that we may encounter a counterfactual. Very good. So, law-like generalizations are more valuable. Next is stat statistical generalization than verifiable statements. Thank oh, you. Oh, wow. Well done. Be on standby, Auntie. You read everything okay, for please. me. Well read. In your nomni adofu kristum. What Madame read now, there is no but or if. Listen, the reason why the empirical scientists, I'm talking about scientists that observe. Empirical means they use their five senses. I'm not talking about deductive studies like logic or math. I'm talking about the empirically based scientific study. Anyone engaged political science, eh? A social, psycho, botany. Eh, eh. Why? Because you are studying human beings and how they behave, or you are studying things and how they behave. You are observing 
economics, what have you. Anyone engaged in that discipline is trying to investigate a world that he or she didn't create. And so we are not certain, we are looking for certainty. That is the heartbeat of the scientist. You, have you seen how many shots of COVID we've, we've, we've gone for? Those who have gone for it and still counting, still. Now they say we should wear nose masks again for some other reason. Because we are always investigating to find out something that we can know for certain, not something that we know for probability. Will you vote for MPP or NDC? I'll vote for NDC. Then you will make a man raise his hand up like that and look inside the head. It's finished until the day of ex election. Then you show him. Because human behavior is not certain. I told you about the economics one. So play back the normative versus the empirical. I told you that you will need it for Unit 7. Those who are listening, you know. The generality of, you know, behavior, when you make claims that are general, there is always a potential of what a counterfactual. There's always a possibility that you find a metal that will not expand when heated. So you see all metals expand when heated. As a scientist, you may have 300 million particular metals that expanded when heated, but your joy is not perfect. When you conclude, therefore, that all metals expand when heated, because there is always the possibility that you will find a metal that will not expand when heated. So you cannot claim to have attained certainty, no matter how many evidences corroborate your generalization. You see, confirmation, therefore, gives you only a degree of probability, a higher degree, a higher degree, but never a certainty. Yet, the empirical scientist is looking for what he or she can be certain about because he didn't create the world. So he doesn't know anything that he can fix his hand on and say, this one, I'm very sure. You don't know. The meteorologist doesn't know. So what? So what? So when the empirical scientist is able to find a falsified theory, after all the plenty of evidences that supported the thing, if we find one metal that will not expand when heated. Wow. A true empirical scientist is excited. Why? Because there's a revolution. He's going to know something for certain. What is, it? what is he going to know for certain? He's going to know, he's now going to know for certain that not knowing not all metals expand when heated, for example. He is going to know something for certain, certainty will come when there's falsifiability. What will he know for certain? He will know that not knowing not all women deliver in nine months after all. Oh, but we had so many evidences that support. Yes, but now we've discovered a certain woman gave birth to the child maybe in seven months. Wow. So what we thought we knew wasn't correct. Yes, now we know something for certain, which is what? Not all women deliver in nine months. So if we can know the truth of every universal statement we have as an empirical scientist, then we adopt what the, the other side of it. What is that? We look for what we can know for certain that it is not true. That one we can. So we know that it is not all planets that orbit the sun. We know that it is not every time you throw a ball up that it will come down. That's why we now aeroplanes can take off. Because we know something else that helps us negotiate the world that we didn't create. So look at the weight of an aeroplane compared to that of a ball. That aeroplane can lift itself up like this, and force of gravity will not bring it down. You put a pen near the pool and drop it, it will enter, it will sink because of the weight, law of flotation. But you put a whole shipload of people on the, on the, on the sea, it's not sinking. Because now we know something. We know that this one that we thought we knew is not the, is not the absolute. So the, the principle of falsifiability does this. It helps, like Madame read, it helps the scientists to attain certainty. Certainty of what? What we didn't know after all. So not know is not all this that fly. It really, yes. But we had a thousand and one instances of birds that fly. Yes, until we encounter one thing that falsifies it. Okay, if we find one, just one bird that will not fly, it has feathers, everything, but won't fly. 
we will come to know something for certain. What is that something? That not all birds fly. So rather than constantly looking for plenty evidences that support a claim, we rather look for just one counter evidence that negates our universal statement. That way we attain certainty faster. We don't just get probable truth that has a high degree of likelihood and yet we can't work with it fully because it can, it can fail us. So we rather look for what can negate our generalization. So if that is what we are looking for, we, we need just, a, just one counterfactual. Which of the generalizations do we have to use? We have to prefer and value the universal generalizations because they are the ones that you can easily falsify. Because it is easier to falsify. It leads us closer to certainty than the one that is not easy to falsify. So every day it is telling us that, oh, this is what is the case. This is what is true. And yet we can't rely on it. That's the logic behind it. So falsifiability is a value for an empirical scientist. A statement that is easier to falsify is more valuable to the empirical scientist. Take note, the empirical scientist prefers such this. After one or two, three, four instances of cholera at a certain hospital, I cry here, maybe another one here, another, oh, then they say, please, cholera is likely going to break out. People should be careful. Why? Because when the claim is generalized, it makes for easier falsifiability. You can easily falsify it. And if it is easier to falsify, then it is more scientific. Why? Because it leads us closer to certainty, which is what we are looking for. Not protecting our theories. We are not trying to protect theories. Science is not dogma. So science is investigating. And so if I'm investigating and I encounter something that makes what I thought I knew false, I don't feel embarrassed that I thought there was no cure for so-and-so. But apparently we, we said this herb and that herb and wow, we have encountered a cure. Where is embarrassment in it? Unless you present scientific study as what? Dogma. Protected. If you protect it or you don't want your findings to be negated, then you are not doing science. Perhaps you have started doing check. Dogma. <laughs> so please get, get your thing muted. My dear lady, please read degrees of confirmability for me. Sister, whose name is Oxygen. Thank you, Dog. Go ahead. Degrees. Degrees of confirmability. Mm -hmm. Statistical hypotheses are easier to confirm than law like hypotheses. That makes statistical hypotheses less valuable to the empirical scientists. Law like hypotheses are easier to falsify, therefore, they are more valuable to the empirical scientists. Take note that is what I have said over and over and over again, my dear friends. If the generalization is a statistical one, it is easier to make it true. It's more probable. But for the scientist, it's not the one that is easier to make true that he or she prefers. You prefer the one that you can easily make false. So that we keep searching if the thing can easily be made false. And over 200 million years, we haven't found just one thing that will make it false. Then you see that it makes our theory more likely to be true. But if you make it easier to be false too, and you find a counterfactual, something that makes it false. We are still happy. We have attained certainty. So you kill two birds with one stone when you are dealing more with what? Universal generalizations than you are dealing with what? Uh, what's the other one? Statistical generalizations. Both of them general. Okay. Just so read this, please. Yep. Scientific statements as testable or falsifiable. To the scientist, to be scientific is to be capable of being true or false. That is to say, to be testable. It makes sense to research only if what we found earlier could turn out to be false. So uncertainty is a virtue in science. Therefore, a statement that cannot be false is a speedo scientific statement. That is, it is not a genuine scientific statement. Example, tautological statements like tomorrow it will rain or it will not rain. And 
she's pregnant or she's not pregnant are always true. Therefore, pseudo scientific. Falsifiability, able to be false, is a sign that the statement is scientific. It is valued by the scientists. Verifiable or confirmable statements are testable or scientific. Very good. Now, what is Madame saying with all this? Just everything I have said. So the fact that we are not certain is not a, it's not something to be ashamed of. It's something we value. It's a virtue. If you are doing empirical study, that is why we keep searching. If we had our answers already, why are we going to search to know whether the sickle cell, uh, you know, anemic patient will die at 18 years? Why did you go and search again? You keep searching because you are looking to see is there a way of negating what we thought we knew? The person's fibroids are this big. Well, but can, can we still find out? So let's do some further research. The, the reason why we search and search and search when you're doing empirical studies is because we never have attained certainty until you negate. When you negate, you are certain that what we thought we knew is not true, that the fish perhaps can stay outside of water for three days if we did A, B, or C that apparently we could grow our flowers on the wall without soil if we did A, B, and C. It is the further research that brings those out. And so a scientist that has a sense of finality to their theories, empirical theories for that matter, generalizations, it's not doing science, it's doing dogma. Statements that have necessity, necessary truths to them, like the ones we have seen on the screen. If you ask me tomorrow, will it rain or will it not rain? And I tell you, Oh, tomorrow, I think it will rain or it will not rain. When tomorrow comes and it rains, what I said is true. When tomorrow comes and what it doesn't rain, what I said is still true. That is not science. Science has a scientific statement, has the ability to be either true or false, can be false. It should have the capacity of being able to be false. So if I tell you, Achu will be found. When we're looking for a brother, uh, he's so rest in peace, Christian Achu. Uh, when we're looking for him, if you, you want to give us a statement that is testable, able to be tested, then that statement must be what? Falsifiable. It should have the capacity of being true or false. Don't tell me that mm, if we pray hard, we'll find our brother. That is not a falsifiable statement. If we go and we find him, you say we prayed hard, that's why. If we go and we don't find him, you say we didn't pray hard. We don't want that. Say, we will find our true our brother. It's a matter of waiting till the day. 31st night, we can say in 2023, third or in the month of January 2023, there will be so I mean dollars will fall from dollars are now open here. Gold will fall from heaven at so and so mountain. That's a testable statement. It's scientific. Is falsifiable, able to be false. All we have to do is what? Wait to, till the day that the prophet prophesied and go to that mountain and go and wait for the gold to fall. If it doesn't fall, what he said is a lie. If it falls, what he said is true. That's scientific. But why you give. A male or a female. They say, oh. Your wife will give birth to, I don't know, no, it's my wife pregnant. I want to use the one on the screen. It's my wife pregnant. You say, oh, your wife is pregnant or either your wife is pregnant or she's not pregnant. That's no information you give me. That's always true, even if I didn't have a wife. Potentially, it's true, necessarily. That's a tautological statement, pretending to be testable. Yet, it is not. It's a pseudo-scientific statement. Pseudo means pretending. There are a lot of pretense-filled friends, pretending to be friends when they are not. So remember that to be scientific, if you are making a note, write it down, is to be testable. To be testable means to be falsifiable. To be falsifiable means valued by the scientists. The scientists want statements that can be false, not statements that are necessarily true. It doesn't inspire research. If it's necessarily true, what are we going to research for again? If we have attained it, we know everything about this world that God created, how human beings behave how you know, our planet and uh, the weather and everything behaves. We know it in total, fully, certainly. Why are we researching? We don't know. <laughs> it's 
a sign of humility. So a true scientist is always willing to investigate, search, get some findings, celebrate a little, but potentially go back and research because what we thought we knew might not be the case. A true scientist, therefore, engages in what? That kind of reasoning and will prefer universal generalizations as more valuable than what? Statistical generalizations. And then after that one, then he or she will consider verifiable statement, which is simply put particular statement. So you know that statements are either particular or general in its six part one. If it is general, there are two types, statistical yeah. or the law-like one. The law-like or universal one, the name we have given them, is the first on the list. If you ask the scientist, he, will, he or she will choose the universal or law-like one first. Then if she has to choose again, and there is no law-like, you will choose the statistical generalization. So generalizations first. Before, if there is still no option, then you will now depend on what? The verifiable statement. That's a particular statement. That's the order of importance or order of value, scientific value, I mean, when we are selecting statement. Okay. Why? Because the more content, and that's, that should be the last slide we discuss, the more content a statement has in the reference class, okay, all women have done so and so and so tells you more. It has more empirical content on my screen now, please look. It says more than the one that says 80% of women has done so and so and so, or most women have done so and so and so. You see the one that said all oh, women, this is the one that said 80% of women. Has, the one that said all oh, women has more content, empirical content, than the one that said 80% of women. They are still talking generalization, but one has a bigger empirical content than the one that talks what? 80%. So universal generalizations have more empirical content than what? Statistical generalization. Both of them are generalizations anyway. Now statistical generalization also has more empirical content than what? Verifiable statement. Verifiable statement just refers to particular statement. It has a finite reference class. That man that meta, this board, you know. So if we go back and revise what I, I have sent you that you discussed with your, your tutor on what particular versus general, it is also in this slide. When you do that revision, you will see particular statements are directly testable because you are dealing with what? A reference class that is finite, is verifiable. Unlike generalizations that are infinite. And even within the generalizations, we've told you that one has what? higher empirical content than the other. And then the statistical is also a better option than the verifiable one in that order. So what, Enoch, I don't like that too. I don't like that. You know, if you see how I'm aggressive here, trying to put knowledge across, don't, don't do that. So what, so on our screen now, sister, please, if you are still there, you're not gone. Kindly sum it up nicely. Read what is on your screen. Okay, please. Empirical content, degrees of falsifiability and predictive power. The more general a statement is, the more empirical content it has. The more empirical content a statement has, the higher its predictive power. The more predictive power a statement has, the easier it is to falsify. The easier it is to falsify a statement, the, the more valuable it is to the scientists. Very good. All these fine things you have read like that, my sister, is simply looking at what the reference class. That is what helps you to know which statement is general and which statement is particular. If you know the statement that is general, it will be more valuable to the scientist, empirical scientist, than the one that is particular. That's one. Two. If the statement is more general, then it means it has more empirical content. It's saying more about the world than the particular one. If I say Helen has done so and so, I'm speaking only about Helen. But if I say women have done so and so, I tell you more about women. Irene, Ante, Ade, and Irene Tonya, what is happening? You mute your mic. Hmm? Okay, so I can talk about women 
who tells you more empirical content compared to if I spoke about the women in my room. So one tells you more. Remember, the scientist is trying to know more about the world and be certain about it. So a generalization tells you more. That's empirical content. It's easier to make false, has a higher degree of certainty associated because all you want is just one counterfactual. Okay, so it's easier to make false, has a higher predictive power. If, I, if a, man, a woman advised the son, hey, we fear women, women there, we are this, this. Look at how I'm speaking in a very generic way. It means that when the brother sees a woman passing, any woman, he has to be minded. He can predict what they are. <laughs> predictive power. That is why I, I jokingly said in the previous recording that because you know that water is a good conductor of electricity, water, water is a good conductor of electricity. When you are in your car and it has rained eh, and uh, whatever falls into the flat, eh, the transformer comes off and falls into the, the electric cables, falls into the flat water. The light is not off, just falling inside. You are in your car, safe somewhere. But you can see the other sister getting out of her car to you know, walk through the rain to her compound. That water, remember, water is a good conductor of electricity. So that water has been electrocuted. You are in your car, you can see the sister coming out. You see how you start shouting. Hey, 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 tell her to stop, sit in the car. Sit. How are you able to predict? How are you able to predict what is going to happen? It is because of what you know about water. Oh, water, you have a higher power of prediction when you know more, okay? So the higher the empirical content, the more valuable it is to the scientists. Take note, the more empirical content a statement has, the higher the predictive power. The higher the predictive power, the easier it is to force it out. Linda, Sule, Lamisin. Do you know why I mention your name? I'm your examiner. I'm your examiner by the grace of God. I will examine you. I have kept telling the class, mute your mic. The time is up. I'm trying to mop up to help you. You open your thing. I mention your name so that you know that I've seen you. I'm your examiner. Somebody. I know how to add marks and subtract marks for behavior. It's part of the training. So you keep opening your microphones and shouting inside. I am your examiner. That is not to scare anybody, but just to put people on their toes. I'm trying to put content across, and we are done, beautifully done. Okay, all right. So empirical content, degree of falsifiability and predictive power. What is the connection? If the statement is a universal generalization, it will have more empirical content than the others in that order should. It will have more than the statistical one. And the statistical also have more than the verifiable one, the particular state. As for pseudo scientific statement, it's empty. There's nothing inside. It's a tautology because it's not falsifiable. Okay. Now, more empirical content also means higher degree of falsifiability. So, universal statement will be easier to falsify than the statistical one, and the statistical will be easier to falsify than the verifiable one. That's particular statement in that order. Then predictive power and swear, if it's a universal generalization, it has a higher predictive power than the statistical. And the statistical will have a higher predictive power than the others, that order. So what? So the empirical scientist would prefer the general, universal generalization, than the statistical one. And he will prefer statistical than verifiable one. He will abhor with all his energy the pseudo-scientific statement. He will reject pseudo-scientific statement protected statement to know. If you got that, we are so done. This is what Madame read. So you see everything I've said is what is going on. Universal generalizations have more empirical content. Look on my screen, some conclusions, they are there. Followed by statistical, then particular statement, which we call verifiable ones. A valuable empirical information must be falsifiable to be scientific. I've said all that. A statement that is not falsifiable cannot be verifiable and confirmable, okay? On your falsifiable, on your scientific. So pseudo tautologies are not scientific. They can't be false. It's always true. That's why we call it tautology. <laughs> it's always true. A bachelor is an unmarried adult male. That's necessarily true. Okay. A statement that is absolutely true has no empirical content. I've explained that. Okay. 
degrees of falsifiability. Maybe one practice question, then we will we'll be done. Look at the reference class for the three, the, the Earth, all the planets. Then the third one says all planets. You will see that the third one is a generalization, all planets, planets of all times, all places, what have you. Which type of generalization? A universal one. Look at example two, all the planets, the planet. This is not a generalization, it's a particular statement. Revise that, okay? You can find a slide up there to that has it. All the planets, look at for example one, the, the Earth, particular planet. So both one and two are what? A verifiable statement or particular statement, but two has more content than one because one says the Earth, the Bakupe. Two says the planets, so there may be four, five, ten, hundred, but they, they can be counted. You can finish counting them, okay? So both one and two are particular statements, but one has more empirical content than the other. Now, example three is a universal generalization. If you were a scientist, which one would be more valuable to you and, and why? That can be an IE question. Will it be one, two, or three? I want a chorus answer. I'll mute an answer. Then we'll mute again and do the particular three. Will be three, please. Will be three. Very good. Okay. Three. Very good. Thank you very much. No problem. Thank you so much. Sorry. Your material. Please, sorry. Thank you very much. Please don't on the <laughs> Thank you. It's correct. I can do a thousand and one things with this slide alone. Like, like what is happening here. See, see, this is a trial. You can practice A, B, C, and D. If I were to compare A, B, C, and D, let me give you just information that you can now use it to answer the questions that follow. A says heavy smoke, uh, smokers are prone to cancer. Reference class infinite. And there is no exception. So A is an example of a universal generalization or a law-like generalization. Every member in the set is affected by that. A. B says most heavy smokers are prone to cancer. It is still a generalization. That's B. But it's a statistical one. C says that heavy smoker is prone to cancer. That, that is particular. So it is not a generalization. It's a verifiable statement. We don't confirm it, we verify it. It is A and B that we confirm because they are generalizations. Yes, sure, Mama. We don't directly test them. We test them indirectly. That's A and B. But C, we test directly so we can verify. How about D? Either that heavy smoker is prone to cancer or he's not prone to cancer. That is a tautology. That one would never be false. It's necessarily true. With that background, you can know which has the least predictive power. You can know two, which has the most empirical content. You can try that on your own. Three, you can know which one is a pseudo scientific statement. Four, you can know which is easiest to falsify and so on and so forth. It is for you to go and practice any quiz. Now I'll take questions if you have them. This slide was a revision slide. Where is it? Oh, the one that has the particular versus general. It was repeated. I pulled it again from here. And this one was in your unit six, particular versus general. I pulled it from there and put it here. Look at the types of generalizations. Universal versus statistical is here. I took it from there and brought it here. This exam, this exercise, practice verifiable versus confirmable state. Directly pulled from unit six here and put here for clarification so you can connect it. So the disease, that's verifiable. With you Ghanaians, I'm speaking in the general sense. I just qualified it, so it's a statistical generalization. That's why you confirm it, confirmable, watch, and so on and so forth. Let me take all questions that you may have. Put up your hand, please, if you have a genuine question that you want to ask. I see 10 hands up. Are they all questions? Uh, constant. I will stop the recording now so that you have